The Royals will have a brand new right fielder in 2024, but he's going to have to bounce back if it means anything. Do I think he will? I'll tell you next on Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are tuned in to another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, I am your host, Jack Johnson, and you can give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. We're also live on Instagram. We're live on TikTok. You can give us follows over there at Locked underscore on underscore Royals. You also can find us very easily on wherever you listen to your podcast. That can be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, We're also on YouTube, and our goal is to get to 1,000 subscribers by opening day 2024. And we've made a lot of progress in the last month, over 200 new subscribers in the last 28 days. So we're very happy about that on this Locked On Podcast Network, and especially on the Locked On Royals channel. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. I know that football season is wrapping up, college basketball season's in full swing. And now just 48 days away from, I believe it's spring training. If I got my numbers matched up right here, I think it's 48 days from spring training. Might be uh, a little bit later when the games start. Because I know in about a month or so, a little over a month, I'd say a month and 10 days, pitchers and catchers are going to report. So to me, that's when baseball really starts getting the swing of things. But with game time, they are the app you need to use to buy your tickets. I already bought opening day tickets for the Kansas City Royals and the Minnesota Twins in late March. And the app I used was Game Time. Got it done in about a minute. And that was just me moving a little bit slowly. You can get tickets so easily. They get them right to you. The app is not complicated. You don't have to go through a bunch of sign-up processes. It is just the best app to use in buying your tickets. And they are a proud sponsor today on the Locked On Royals channel. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you can always give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. And I know typically we do Mailbag Fridays. It's been a little bit weird. I promise we're going to bring those back and get more consistent on that. Uh, Just because the last couple weeks have been hectic, Christmas, New Year's. uh, We're going to get back into the swing of things of that. So not to worry. I may even do a a Mailbag Friday extension where tomorrow's episode, which I plan to go in out tomorrow, will be Mailbag oriented. So that's actually what we may do as I'm kind of talking on the fly and creating this as we go. But for the opening segment today, I want to give a little bit more of a context into a guy that I think has to provide a certain amount of production for this team to be anywhere near a competitive level in 2024. And at the end of the day, when you make a flurry of moves, the headliner is going to get all the talk for a while, right? We, we've already gone over Michael Walker. Uh, we've already done a, a podcast episode on Seth Lugo. But one guy we haven't had the chance to dive into is Hunter Renfro. And I think that Hunter Renfro is a guy that the Royals are expecting to bounce back. He's certainly got the numbers to back that up. Fangraphs thinks he's going to bounce back. Baseball Reference thinks he's going to bounce back, just in some overall projections. Uh, But this is a move that when it happened, I I think my original feeling was it's an upgrade. Okay, right field wasn't very good for the Royals last year. I knew it wasn't going to take Nelson Velasquez's spot. It was likely going to take Drew Waters' spot. It was going to take Edward Olivares' spot. Uh, Still kind of up in the air on what Drew Waters is going to be for this team. If he makes the opening day roster, if he's traded, if he starts in AAA, I'm not even sure if he actually has options to go down in AAA. So I'll need to do more of a deep dive into that. But to me, it was it's not a sexy signing. It was a one-year deal. I think there's a player option for a second year. It was cheap. And Hunter Renfro wasn't that good last year. Uh, But at the end of the day, this is a guy that I really felt like had a couple of good years that you bank on happening again. Maybe not as good as he was for Boston in 2021, but there were good years for Hunter Renfro when he was in Milwaukee just uh, two years ago. Last year was, to me, a bit of the outlier. You know, when you look at the last three years, two of them were very good. Two of those years... Uh, would be very productive, uh, better than anticipated for the Royals in 2024. 
And another thought that popped into my mind when Hunter Renfro was signed was that the Royals have done this a lot in the last five years or so. Remember, they did it with Carlos Santana. Um, That didn't work out the way they thought it would. But still, I thought it was a very good gamble at the time because he's a player that can bounce back with a a plate approach like that. A guy that walks a lot, has some power. He killed the Royals for years when he was with Cleveland. They also did it with Andrew Benintendi. That worked out. Andrew Benintendi was an all-star. He won a gold glove. They flipped him for three prospects, even though one of them is now no longer in the organization. It worked out. That was a move that panned out because they believed the Andrew Benintendi of two years ago was going to return once he got to Kansas City, and that happened. Andrew Benintendi was a great player for the Royals. And you go back almost 10 years now, which just pains me to say it, they did it with Kendrys Morales. Kendrys Morales was coming off a very poor year. He didn't have spring training. The Royals identified that and said, we think with a full spring training, Kendrys Morales can be a 25 to 30 home run DH guy, a 100 RBI guy, and he was exactly that in 2015 and was also very productive in 2016. I think they looked at Hunter Renfro and said, that's the type of move that has worked out for us before. The good thing about Renfro, though, is that I love his defense. He's got one of the best arms in baseball. Uh, That is absolutely going to be put on display early on in the season. He's got incredible raw power. Um, I think that he is somebody that you can pencil in as the five or six hitter. But at the same time, you can't load up that lineup with a bunch of swing and miss guys, like four, five, and six. There has to be some relief there because this lineup's all about protection. Some of these guys are not going to perform well if the protection's not there, right? Salvador Perez is a big swing and miss guy that doesn't walk. Personally, I wouldn't like to see Salvi and Hunter Renfro back-to-back because Hunter Renfro is a big swing and miss guy. Now, he's got a better approach than Salvador Perez does, as do eight of the other hitters in the lineup. Let's be quite honest. Salvi's a a multiple-time all-star, multiple-time gold glove guy, but I don't think we've ever defended Salvador Perez's overall approach. He's just, I'm going to swing and hopefully I hit the hell out of the ball. He's not really identifying the best pitches. That's also what makes him Salvador Perez. He's a great bad ball hitter. You don't want your entire lineup, though, filled with bad ball hitters. You want guys that wait for their pitch and square up the right one. So you can maybe mix and match a little bit. I would like to see maybe a Salvador Perez at four, MJ Melendez is a five, and then Renfro is a six. Because I think Renfro can really thrive in the five or six hole of this lineup, but you have to make sure it has some has some flow to it. But I do think he is somebody that before spring training – I'd buy a little bit of stock into. I really would. Uh, last year with the Angels and the Reds, it it wasn't very good because I think that there was no protection in that lineup. I would go as far to say this Royals lineup is more well-rounded, I think, and not as top-heavy as the Angels were. I think the Angels, talent-wise, star-wise, had far more star power, right? You have Mike Trout and Shohei Otani, but injuries to Mike Trout, right? They still can't get Anthony Rendon on the field. It was an Angels lineup that was so top heavy, has always been top heavy. And when you're kind of the middle of the group guy, you're seen as the fourth or fifth contributor. There's a lot of 4A guys there. Now the Royals, I'll be honest, they've had plenty of 4A players in the last five to six years. And there still are some guys that have to prove they're not 4A players in 2024. But I think with a Vinny Pasquantino hitting in front or behind him. Uh, Even MJ Melendez, who has a good eye at the plate, a good walk rate. Uh, If you mix and match a little bit more and find, you know, maybe a Michael Garcia ahead or behind him, I think it can work out in your favor, right? Even Nelson Velasquez has worked on a little bit, but that's also another part of this. You don't want a a Salvi Renfro, Nelson Velasquez, four, five, and six, uh, because it's too much swing and miss right there. I really think Vinny Pasquantino kind of giving them relief in the middle. That allows Hunter Renfro to have a much better you know, production role at the plate, I should say. Uh, but I, I do think the level of expectation is not sky high. Um, but I do think it's better than where I was at with Fran Mill Reyes. I liked the move for Fran Mill Reyes last year, but I also knew that when you pick somebody up off waivers, there's a reason they were DFA'd. And Hunter Renfro was DFA'd last year. Right, And then I think he ended up playing in a game that he was DFA'd earlier that afternoon. It was kind of weird with the Angels. So you have to know that when a guy's DFA'd, you're not going to see an all-star level player. And I don't think that Hunter Renfro 
is going to come close to being an all-star. But there is things to like about his game that can make him very valuable and a better option than what right field was last year. Drew Waters, a lot of swing and miss, a good defender, but he's not going to be an everyday type of player, in my opinion. Hunter Renfro gives you more stability. Pretty good defense out there, not so much in the range category, but arm-wise, incredible. The power, there's 25 to 30 home run potential there. And then I would say just overall production, you're looking at a one to two, maybe two and a half war player. And I would take that from Hunter Renfro. I really would. Considering what you had in right field last year, I think it is an upgrade. And it was not the most appreciated move by the national pundits out there. But I liked what he said when he was on MLB Network. I like that they're believing this is a playoff team. But to be a playoff team, he's going to have to be one of those big-time pop guys in the middle of the lineup. So are you going to buy stock in Hunter Renfro? Let us know in the YouTube comments or reach out to me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. We're going to take our first break of the show. When we come back, I'm going to go over the importance of the Royals jumping on that free agent market like they did earlier in the month of December and why now I'd be panicking a little bit if I hadn't made a move. But fortunately for Royals fans and for the Royals in general, it's good that they're not having to struggle finding guys this late in the offseason. So we'll dive into that next on Locked on Royals. You are tuned into Locked on Royals on the Locked on Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. You also can find us on wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts. We're also on Odyssey. And check us out on YouTube. Just be sure to follow and subscribe. Before we go any further, want to give a shout out to one of the title sponsors today in game time. I am strongly urging fans to go out there and start buying tickets for opening day. Let's try and sell out Kauffman Stadium. I've already bought my tickets and I bought them on game time. The easiest app to use when you are buying tickets. You don't need to stress about big numbers, whether you're going by yourself, you're going with your family, girlfriend, boyfriend, multiple people, big party. Use game time. It was so easy. It took me about a minute to get everything that I wanted. I can handle the parking situation. I can look where the view of the seats are. And then I know those tickets are going to be waiting for me when late March rolls around, baseball rolls around, and opening day, more specifically, rolls around. So if you're worried about anything, worrying about buying tickets, thinking about it, stop thinking about it, and go to game time today and start buying your tickets, not just for baseball events. We got concerts, right? You can go to football games, college basketball. You know, college football is almost over, but get geared up for next season if you want to go that early. It's just so easy to use. No stress, no problem with it. And I would say after you listen to this podcast, go and download the app today. It is just the best app to go to. Go and create your account and use code Locked on for $20 off on your first purchase. So there you go. If you are thinking about buying opening day tickets, go buy them right now. Use code locked on and save $20 off if that is your first purchase. The terms apply. And again, create your code and redeem code locked on L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I, I would say that. There are a couple of times in the offseason that I'll repeat myself. If you've listened to me long enough before, you may get tired that I repeat myself a lot on this show. But overall, I feel like there is a full circle moment that happens a handful of times, right? I'll bring up a segment idea. I'll leave it open-ended. Something happens down the road. I tie it back in. Or I have an opinion. It changes over time. Then my opinion completely changes. Now I got to go full circle. I remember early on, I want to say it was October, November, one of those months. It was before the Royals started going crazy on the transaction wire. And I said to J.J. Piccolo, I know he's probably not listening unless he's a sucker for getting Royals content all over. There's there's plenty of great accounts out there uh, that I love to watch all the time. But I urged J.J. Piccolo to do something that really hadn't been done since the Royals were competing, you know, since they were chasing pennants in the American League back in the Dayton Moore era. And even in the Dayton Moore era, it never really happened. And that was jumping on the free agent market. When you are a small market team, I always refer to it as the runt of the litter. You are the runt. And what happens to the runt? He dies if he doesn't get enough 
food source. He doesn't get enough water. And you think about it in a, in a farm terminology, you know, pigs and piglets and stuff. When there's the runt and there's the feeding trough, the big pigs are going to get to the trough all the time. Those are the big market teams to me. They never have to worry about it. They can easily walk over the trough, stick their head in and start eating. The runts have to make sure they get there first. Because if they don't, the big pigs are going to go and take all their food. And that, to me, is this weird analogy of how the baseball offseason works. You can use pigs, what other animal you would say could be the run to the litter. Dogs, if you want to. But it had never really been done in Kansas City. Despite having success, right, winning the American League twice, back-to-back years, winning a World Series championship, you know, bringing baseball back to Kansas City, that was important. But the Royals very few times just jumped on the market. Like before things really settled down, they were aggressive. And that was different this year. That was different with J.J. Bacolo and John Sherman. It was not the most loaded and ridiculous free agent field we'd ever seen. But there's a lot of talent out there. There was a lot of pitching talent that could significantly improve this team. And instead of reaching out to a couple of guys, making the phone calls, hearing them out a little bit, hearing out their agents saying what they want, and then going, well, we'll wait a couple of weeks, we'll wait a month, and then we'll revisit it, like they had done many times before. They wanted to act on it. And I don't think they significantly overpaid on anybody they got, really. Seth Lugo for $15 million a year. You got Michael Walker, I think, around, what was it, $14 million a year. It wasn't too bad at all. Hunter Renfro was a cheap... You know, less than seven, eight million dollars in a year. Will Smith was cheaper. Chris Stratton was cheaper. They filled so many holes on their roster really before anybody could blink. Uh, they were the talk of the baseball offseason when the Dodgers weren't signing every superstar that's ever played and dropping 700 million and 550 million. When they weren't doing that, people were talking about the Royals because they were going after guys that were being targeted by multiple teams. I remember reading multiple articles of the top 10 pitchers out there. You know, you've got you know, Blake Snell, who's still unsigned. You had Sonny Gray up there, but Seth Lugo was on that list. Marcus Stroman was on that list. Michael Walker was on that list. Royals got two of those guys. And in years past, that wouldn't happen because they were going to wait for the market to come to them. That's what a lot of small market teams do. I mean, I'm looking around baseball right now. I, what the Rockies are doing, what the A's are doing, what the White Sox, for whatever they're doing, getting former Royals players on bad teams with Chris Getz now running that team and Pedro Grafol as the manager. They're basically just the 2019 Royals at this point. But what they're doing is feeding into the small market identity. Oh, we're not going to match those prices. We're not going to go for them. So we'll just wait till somebody becomes available. Somebody's DFA. Somebody's put on waivers. And that, to me, is a losing formula. Unless you're the Rays, who have shown that with little money, they can build a winner. Uh, Unless you're that team, you're not doing it the way you should be in baseball. It's why the draft lottery system has de-incentivized losing baseball games, right? And instead of going out there and tanking and waiting for a high draft pick, you want to go out there and spend money. And I think the Royals were a little bit ticked off, not a little bit, a lot of it ticked off. They got the seventh overall pick. After losing 106, there's no more reason to lose. So what they wanted to do was jump on the market, significantly boost this team, make this team better. And the only way they could do that and get the guys they wanted is if they went out in front, if they were the first piglet to the trough. They didn't let the other big pigs come in and push them around and say, yeah, we were a winner. The Royals are not. We'll give you 10 million a year, 11 million. You're going to be our number four. The Royals had the pitch of Michael Walker, you can be our one. Seth Lugo, you can be our number two, number three. You're making big money. And that, to me, was so important to get people buying into this team a little bit. Now, we discussed in the podcast episode yesterday that you have a a Royals team that is going and trying to make themselves competitive. And on paper, they're doing it. But at the end of the day, A lot of fans are not going to buy into what you're doing until you win. They're giving themselves a good chance to win. And the only way they could have done that in the offseason before you take the field is jumping on the market. I look at the American League Central right now. Cleveland has not done anything, really. Chicago has not done anything. 
Detroit has. Detroit's kind of neck and neck with Kansas City and trying to be aggressive, getting Jack Flaherty, getting Kenta Maeda, getting Mark Canna. They're trying to be active as well, but they've got more pieces in place than the Royals do. Minnesota, the division winner, they haven't done anything really. And that's where if I was a fan of a small market team and I knew the team needed to improve, I'd be tensing up a little bit going, wow, you really don't think any of these guys are worthy? I mean, there's so many bullpen guys out there. There's so many starters still out there. And the fact that it's all settled and quiet now, I think things will ramp back up by the end of January because once February rolls around, you got pitchers and catchers reporting a few weeks in. Like, it's not as long of a time now before the start of the season. You can be a little bit sluggish in November and December and say, well, We've got till January. January is here. The New Year's happened. And fortunately for Royals fans, you're not having to stress about, man, the only move we made was Jordan Lyles. They filled out their rotation. They filled out their bullpen almost, and they still want to add one more player. They might be trying to test the market on that, but that's all right if it's a super utility guy off your bench that you're waiting to see, not if you're trying to replenish an entire rotation. All right, before we move on to our final segment, Want to give a shout out to Locked On Sports today. It's here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. When we come back, I'm going to ask the question if Michael Massey can provide the Royals enough value to stick at second base. That's next on Locked On Royals. You are tuning to Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. Before we go any further, let's give a shout out to the other title sponsor today in FanDuel. With the NFL regular season wrapping up, there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there's so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays, finding bets in the new Explore tab, making parlays in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, by the way, and much, much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Over the last couple weeks or so, maybe I should stretch it back into about the last month or two, I've been getting into more and more debates about what the Royals should do at second base in regards to Michael Massey. Uh, you bring in Garrett Hampson all right, this past offseason, a guy that got a lot of run, a lot of playing time with the Miami Marlins who went on to the postseason. You've got Nick Lofton who shined toward the back half of last year. And then you've got Michael Massey, who for the most part of the year struggled, but also hit a point in the second half where I thought provided a lot of value for the Royals at second base. You know, you run into 15 home runs, you play really good defense over there. That can be desirable for not just the Royals, but a lot of teams out there when you're looking at your second base uh, positional guy. And I think what it comes down to for me when discussing if Michael Massey has value or not is... Just that I think the second base position, you've probably heard me say this before, is not that much of a premium. I do not think that you look at second base and look for the production a shortstop gives you, right? Shortstop and center field are the most important positions on the field. And when you do not have production at those spots, it really hinders your lineup overall. I see second base more of a just a bonus, really. If you've got a really good second baseman, that's just an added bonus to the lineup. It's kind of like having a really good right fielder, which fitting enough, we talked about Hunter Renfro in today's episode. But second base, I think it comes down to me, good defense. If you can provide really good defense and not be a black hole in the lineup, that's fine for second base. But you've probably heard me bring it up before in a Michael Massey debate that, you know, with Past Royals teams, winning Royals teams, well, second base wasn't always the most effective, successful player on the team. You go back to 2014, you know, Omar Infante was there. Omar wasn't very good defensively, and he wasn't that great at the plate. And in 2015, you had Infante for the majority of the year. Then they did pivot and got Ben Zobris, but that's the bonus you get, right? When you can have somebody like Ben Zobris, that's important. 
But then in, in other years, you know, you could have Nicky Lopez there. It was really good defense. But I think some fans kind of misconstrue uh, what makes a second baseman valuable. I really think uh, offensively, it's the weakest position on the field. Uh, I don't think there are truly hundreds and hundreds of great second basemen out there. To me, a second baseman is a shortstop who didn't really have the arm strength or the range or the the timing, really, to be a shortstop. That, to me, is what a second baseman is. Not to say that D values them considerably. I just think you have to look at them in a different way. You have to evaluate a player a, a different way. And that's the way I'm going about it with Michael Massey. Now, he is one of the guys, I, I believe I've already brought it before, he does not have a long leash. I'm not going to extend that for no reason. Michael Massey is just a, a stopgap guy to me, really. But I think he also can fit into this team's role in route to trying to make them a winner, trying to win this division this year. I think he's the best option going into opening day. I think that is very important to point out. Uh, Nick Lofton can be the guy. I think he's got the talent to be that guy. And if Michael Massey struggles in April, there's going to be a lot of people, probably me included, that are pounding the table to get Nick Lofton out there. Because when you have Kyle Isbell out there, you've got MJ Melendez, Michael Massey, guys that need to prove themselves worthy in the lineup. You know, at least for Melendez and Isbell, there's not really a replacement for them right now. There is an immediate replacement for Michael Massey if things don't go well. And that's why I also don't look at it as a rushing situation. I don't feel like the Royals need to rush uh, that type of decision. Because what happens then if you make Nick Lofton your everyday second baseman and let's say he struggles like Michael Massey last year, as young players do, and then you've already benched Michael Massey, he's out of rhythm, maybe the confidence is shot. Like this just feels like the best way to handle it, in my opinion. Michael Massey had it last year. Let him get the first run, the first part of the season. If he plays well, all the better for the team. If he struggles, well, then you can turn to Nick Lofton. Or if Samad Taylor's raking, you can go to Samad Taylor. Garrett Hampson's another piece that you could go to. So there are options if Michael Massey doesn't pan out. But I just think the overall opinion of Michael Massey is very critical based off what we saw last year. But there were a lot of guys that struggled and took steps back last year. And that's just my my message to those listening out there. That's my mindset going into there was a lot of guys that struggled, but because you know, he was second base and he really was a black hole in the lineup for a long time, you want to jump ship. And the minute you get a taste of you know better performance, even for a small period of time, I mean Nick Lofton played like 20 games last year. That may not be enough right now to just leapfrog Massey for the opening day spot. They also could go into spring training and say second base is up for grabs. It's Massey or Lofton. Whoever duels it out in spring training comes out on the other side is our second baseman. Wouldn't shock me in the slightest to see something like that. But I will say that Michael Massey is a guy the Royals do like a lot. They love his defense and they think the offense is going to turn things around. And for that, I think I can be pretty thrilled with and I'm not going to be too upset if he's the guy in April and May and even in early June. Because if he turns things around, then you still do have a great second base for you. Not one of the best out there, but just somebody that can you know, shoulder the workload a little bit, take on that pressure. And if you got a good defense and you're just good enough at the plate, that's fine by me for Michael Massey. Well, that's going to do it for our first episode today of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. Be sure to give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 1-5. We're going to have another episode posting in a few hours, and we're going to have plenty of more to get into. So keep it posted on YouTube. Uh, stay tuned. Stay locked in. I know it's a little bit cliche. On Twitter, I'll be sure to get everything out in a timely manner, but want to make up for the mistake that I had last night. It's having some technical difficulties, but we should be all good to go today. But until later on today, you take it easy, Kansas City.